Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we have important papers in organic synthesis featuring the chemistry of organothiocyanates. Part 1 will be discussing some of the chemistry of synthesizing organothiocyanates. If you're looking to synthesize alkyl thiocyanates, the most straightforward way to do this is through the substitution of a halide or a pseudohalide, such as a bromide, a mesylate, or even a diazo compound. This is really straightforward. You just do your typical substitution chemistry, either in a protic solvent or in a polar solvent like DMF. You can monitor these reactions by TLC, as the resulting thiocyanate tends to be more polar than the starting halide. However, in the case of aryl thiocyanates, the synthesis can be less straightforward. In most instances, you'll be looking to just buy a building block with an existing thiocyanate, as there's lots of these that are available. However, if you're looking to scale up, and you need more than a gram or so, you'll probably want to be making it yourself. Some of these approaches are more specialized, such as this boronic acid approach, which uses TMS isothiocyanate as a thiocyanating agent, and requires a whole slew of reagents just to get it to work. Alternatively, you can go from an aryl diazonium using a Sandmeyer reaction, introducing a thiocyanate group through the use of copper thiocyanate, along with some other reagents. Compared to your traditional synthesis of aryl groups, this is somewhat prohibitive. However, there are some alternative approaches that you can use. One such example is the use of hypervalent iodine reagents, which couple quite well with thiocyanate. As I mentioned previously, you can use TMS isothiocyanate, and this will couple with boronic acids. However, when boronates were used, such as a B-pin, only poor yields were obtained. Additionally, a BF3 anion in the same place also gave little to no conversion, requiring the use of boronic acids for this coupling strategy. Now, there's a better way to make thiocyanate groups if you have a relatively electron-rich arene. This is some work from Dean Tost's grad school work, and this is what I would classify as the one good electrophilic thiocyanating agent, as the other ones are complete trash. I've worked with this reagent, and I was initially skeptical to see how well it would work, as prior to my use of this reagent, I'd made the analog of NFSI and fluorodibenzene sulfonamide, and it was completely unstable in air. So when I tested out chemistry with N-thiocyanosuccinamide, I was quite pleased to obtain almost quantitative yields of my thiocyanated product. You can see, even though this was submitted in 1996, they explored a decent range of arenes, not just extremely electron-rich substrates like indoles and anilines, but you can see even a thioanisole is tolerated. We tend to see a paradirecting effect of electron donating groups, and this even worked on an aniline containing a nitro group demonstrating that they could override the meta-selectivity of that nitro group, and instead we got a paradirecting effect from the aniline. This was also able to react directly with thiophene and iodothiophene. The only case where they observed multiple products is in the case of this electron-rich 5-methoxyindole derivative, where they obtained a mixture of diastereomers, where the thiocyano group would not only add to the 3 position of the indole, which is highly nucleophilic, but also ortho to the methoxy group, either in the 4 position or the 6 position. Now, there is another electrophilic N-thiocyano reagent. This is N-thiocyanosaccharin, and if I have to be honest, the chemistry of what you can do with this is as bland as saccharin. There isn't anything revolutionary here that couldn't already be done with N-thiocyanosaccinamide, and it often requires a really strong activator, especially for the electrophilic aromatic substitution chemistry, which requires the use of triflic acid. Similar to N-thiocyanosaccharin, there's N-thiocyanodibenzene sulfonamide. And prior to the publication of the paper where this was reported, I'd actually made some of this in my own research lab. However, it turned orange within a day or two and spontaneously released hydrogen cyanide in air. So yeah, we uh, didn't work with this reagent too much, and then when the authors finally put this paper out, I was immediately like, how did they work with this? It was so unstable. And naturally, they used it in a glove box. So the takeaway is, if you make this even more electron deficient, these reagents seem to be relatively unstable, so I would just encourage you to use N-thiocyanosuccinamide, and don't waste your time with these other meme reagents. There are a few more that I just want to show here, but please don't waste your time with any of these, except for N-thiocyanosuccinamide. Part 2, the applications of organothiocyanates. So some of the various applications of thiocyanates include transformation of the thiocyanogroup group into tetrazoles, thiophosphonates, thioethers, 
thiocarbamates, the formation of disulfides, the formation of fluorinated thioethers, the synthesis of thioalkynes, as well as the synthesis of thiotriazoles. This isn't comprehensive, but it gives you a snapshot of what's possible to do with thiocyano groups. For example, you can substitute the cyanide group on the thiocyano group through the use of a Grignard reagent. This works not only for aliphatic, but also vinyl Grignards. And if you're looking to substitute it with an alkyne, all you need is a lithiated terminal alkyne, and that will do substitution similarly. It's also possible to use organolithiums to do this type of substitution, which is something you'll occasionally see. Now, let's say you don't want to use a Grignard or an organolithium for whatever reason. Instead, you can treat this thiocyanate with either base or sodium sulfide, which is supposed to lead to the hydrolysis of that thiocyanate group. Although this may be a little bit substrate dependent, maybe it needs to be a little bit electron rich, such as the case of this unsubstituted indole. And then subsequently, this can be alkylated in the presence of your typical alkylating agent. Now, if you want to synthesize tetrazoles, which can be really useful for Julia olefination after the sulfide has been oxidized to the corresponding sulfone, all you have to do is treat this with sodium azide in the presence of tetrabutyl ammonium chloride. It's also possible to cyclize alpha thiocyanoketones to the corresponding thiazoles with a halogen substituted in between the nitrogen and the sulfur. This could then be used further for cross-coupling or any other sort of nucleophilic displacement. This first example shows the use of hydrogen bromide to accomplish this, and in the second example, we can see that hydrogen chloride is used. Another cool thing that you can do is you can take an alkynyl halide, which by the way are easily prepared with treatment of silver nitrate catalytically in the presence of acetone with whatever your halogenating agent is. This will lead to rapid silver catalysis where the silver acetylide is formed, and subsequently, the halogen will pop right onto that position. This is how you can make the iodide and the bromide, except I believe for the chloride it's a little bit more tedious. Once you have this halo alkyne, it's then possible to treat it with a thiocyano source, which will then add to the alpha position, and it will also be protonated in the ipso position, adding in a trans fashion. Here's some examples where silver acetate was used with potassium thiocyanate on the corresponding alkynyl bromides, which prepared a series of products with excellent functional group compatibility. With these reagents, you can then convert them to, for instance, the substituted aminothiazole, or you could substitute the nitrile with CF3 through the use of TMS-CF3 and a fluoride source. Alternatively, you can do cross-coupling chemistry with an alkyne under palladium catalysis, to afford the corresponding thiophene. I was just mentioning that you can use TMS-CF3 in the presence of a fluoride source to substitute that cyano group and form TMS cyanide, or TMS fluoride, if you have a quantitative amount of fluoride present. This works not only for TMS-CF3, but also for substituted perfluoroalkyl silanes. Here's an example where an aryl thiocyanate was converted to the corresponding aryl trifluoromethyl thioether. The advantage of doing this on an aryl thiocyanate is that if you're synthesizing libraries of compounds, you can substitute out this thiocyano group to various fluorinated thioethers, which would be useful for preparing a library. However, if you were to instead use an electrophilic CF3 reagent, you would only be afforded with this final product and you wouldn't be able to diversify it further. So there's a massive incentive to start with a thiocyano group and prepare a whole library of building blocks, especially if you're working in pharma. Here's an example on aliphatic thiocyanate where it's converted to the corresponding trifluoromethyl thioether. Now, you might be wondering how generalizable this is, but it's even possible to take ferrocene, prepare the corresponding thiocyanate through the displacement of a bromide or iodide in the presence of a copper catalyst, and then substitute the cyanide group with TMSCF3. So this is applicable, broadly speaking. Not only does this work on aryl and aliphatic thiocyanates, but it even works on vinyl thiocyanates. If you're looking to use a difluoromethyl thioether, you can still use TMS-CF2H. However, the conversion of this product benefits from the presence of copper thiocyanate as a mediator. You will still obtain some product in the absence of copper catalysis. In fact, I've made benzyl SCF2H before, and it does still convert, but the yield is lower if you don't use a copper catalyst. Maybe this suggests that a copper catalyst would aid with all of these transformations, but that remains to be seen in the literature to date. 
Here's a scope of some of the difluoromethylthioethers that they prepared, demonstrating that a wide range of functional groups were tolerated, and this was applicable not only to aliphatic thiocyanates, but also to aryl thiocyanates. So as I was saying before, just make a thiocyanate and then substitute off the cyano group with whatever RF group you want to use. Otherwise, you're just going to have to go through some tedious synthesis to prepare random SR reagents that might be challenging to otherwise prepare. And I want to highlight again, you can treat this with Grignards as well. So you can try making fluorinated and non-fluorinated analogs. So if you're looking to make bioisosters, for instance, if you're getting oxidation at a sulfur position, this route minimizes the redesigning of the entire synthesis so that you can just get some material and test it. Here's an example where instead of a CF2H or a CF3 group, we can also have the corresponding difluoroacetate derivatives. So here these ethyl difluoroacetate thioether analogs were prepared on substrates containing a wide range of functional groups, demonstrating that even a wider range of fluorinated TMS groups were all tolerated for this type of chemistry. They also demonstrated this on a series of alpha ketone derivatives, preparing what looked like some pretty appealing building blocks. Finally, they demonstrated this on some aryl thiocyanates. So if I haven't convinced you by now that this works on thiocyanates broadly speaking, I hope that this really does the job of convincing you. However, not only does this work with alkyl fluorinated silanes, it also works on vinyl fluorinated silanes, as was reported in this patent shown here. So this is a broadly applicable methodology to make fluorinated thioether derivatives. The last couple that I wanted to mention here were the substituted triazole derivative, which was added to this dihydroisoxazole derivative. And additionally, if you take TMS-CF2-CF3, this also works just as you'd expect with TMS-CF3. I've also done this sort of transformation before, except I think I used cesium fluoride instead of potassium fluoride, and it worked fine. Maybe the yields weren't as high as what they report here, but this may just benefit through the use of copper thiocyanate as a catalyst. So the takeaway from all of this chemistry is that alkyl thiocyanates are easy to prepare via nucleophilic displacement. However, aryl thiocyanates can usually be bought. There are ways to make them, as I've demonstrated, and if you can use that dean tossed chemistry with N-thiocyanosuccinamide, that's probably your best bet to making thiocyanates. However, there are other ways to make them, but they're a little bit steppy and frustrating. Do you have bigger synthetic problems? Do you have synthetic challenges which would benefit from some attention from a skilled synthetic chemist? Maybe you're working with a CRO or a synthesis on demand company who's running into some roadblocks, or maybe you're trying to set up your own synthesis in-house. I'm still accepting a few more consulting clients for the 2025 year. If you'd like to get in touch, my email is listed down below. Alternatively, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.